And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Eric Dane Mansfield, mystic bard who has had two near-death experiences and more, which we're going to learn about today. Eric, thank you for joining me and welcome. Aloha, namaste, and thank you, Jeff. You have a wonderful channel, and I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much, Eric. If you don't mind, let's start chronologically with your first NDE and go from there. You got it. Okay, so when I was four years old, and I lived in Corona Del Mar, California, on in a beautiful neighborhood. Um, my mom was a single mother. I had a stepdad, but they weren't married yet. And we had a beautiful little house. And in front of our house, there was this gorgeous tree. And hanging from the tree was this giant beehive. The old kind you would see in the cartoons with it looks like a coil pot that you make in ceramics. Giant. It was half the size of me. And I was throwing rocks at it at four years old. And my mother looked at me. She was bringing stuff in the house. And she said, I wouldn't do that. That's going to fall on your head. Of course, I didn't listen. And it fell on my head right over my head. You could not have been a more perfect fall. And I got stung over 880 times in my throat, in my ears, up my nose, everywhere on my upper body. And I uh, went into shock and my mom did not take me to the hospital. She just put me in, in the house and I left my body. Now, I was four years old. I didn't know who Jesus was. My mom was not religious. She was raped by a bishop of the Episcopal Church when she was in high school. So she was anti-religion. And my dad wasn't there. And so I didn't know anything. And all of a sudden, I was in this really warm, very luminous environment. And there was this hippie dude in sandals in a white robe who was holding me and i could see him holding me but i could also see through my eyes and he was speaking to me telepathically this was yeshua and he was just holding me and telling me it's okay just learn to listen he was saying it in my mind and i couldn't hear it because i was dazed and amazed by this luminous beautiful harmonious non-stressful place that I was in it was like uh, uh well when you're that young you're kind of in that place a lot already so it didn't really seem foreign to me and I don't remember coming back into my body that time I think it was uh the next day um and I have an experience from the next NDE that was in that same house so uh that was when I met Yeshua and I didn't know who he was uh, for years uh, until my Catholic friend tried to take me to catechism once and they wouldn't let me in. So um, that was my first NDE. And the funny thing is, it made me allergic to bees for about a year and then it went away. I've been stung by hornets and bees and everything since then. Doesn't bother me. Okay, so that was the first one. Do you think after that experience, anything fundamentally changed within you? because you crossed the veil, like did you become psychic or see any beings or anything? Okay, yes, it did It did awaken. I'm extremely psychic. In fact, I've had to hide from it all my life. I could have made a lot of money as a medium, but I chose not to. And yes, it definitely activated that, but all it did was, I was an extremely abusive childhood. And I mean, if I told you, you wouldn't want those pictures in your mind. And um, at the time I was really having a hard time dealing with, when you're that young, your mind is extremely innocent and you make judgments that last the rest of your life. So I think the two things that happened was it gave me a little bit of sense of a deeper sense of harmony, no matter how much I was being beaten and abused. Um, and then it also made it easier for me to answer the call at 12 years old on my own. And the way that happened is I was, I was really good with animals. And we had a cat that had kittens and she was in a utility closet in our apartment. And I went in there to take care of the mama and the kittens. And I looked on the shelf and I found the complete works of Shakespeare and Mary Baker Eddy's Science and Health. And I opened both of the books and started reading. And I have a 186 IQ. I was in a program called Mentally Gifted Minors, right? So I'm extremely gifted, not only physically, but intelligently. And I'm not trying to be ego. That's just the fact. And um, 
So I grasped what I was reading, Shakespeare and Mary Baker Eddy. Wow, I was like, what's this? And I asked my mother later that day and she's like, oh, don't read that stuff. That's your dad. I was like, Shakespeare, really? So she was trying to keep me away from it. Um, but that was when I was 12 years old. That's when I answered the call. I knew right then and there, there was more to this life than what appears. And I had already experienced Yeshua, but I sublimated that. I didn't remember that for years. And so here's the, the big one. Now, if we go chronologically, I have other experiences in between. One I will tell you is what you guys refer to as a fear death experience. When I was in high school in Pacific Palisades in California, uh, uh oh, I lost you. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Before you move forward, I want to ask you something. Sure. What do you mean by you answered the call? Okay, all of us, you know how in scripture, like the Bible, sorry about this, I try not to wiggle it. I don't think the perch will work anymore. In the Bible, it tells you there's a still small voice and that's your soul, your, your true self, capital S. And um, it also says, I stand at the door and knock and that's the Christ, which is the universal impersonal self of all being. It's also the Buddha and the Krishna, it's just different words. And we're offered the opportunity constantly to be still and know. And that is answering the call when you open the door and you allow something more than what the five physical senses are telling you, then your third eye becomes activated and uh, you start your thing. Now I wanna, I wanna put a warning here. We all have to do it. We're all on the hero's journey, all of us. But once you have the experience, and I'm talking about the genuine experience, not belief. Belief has nothing to do with this. Belief is a joke. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Once you have the experience, it ruins you as a human. It ruins your life. You can never go back to being the way you were. And when you do, if you go against your soul, you suffer tremendously. And I can tell you I've suffered a lot because I didn't listen. And what Yeshua told me when I was four is listen. And if I had to listen to my mother, I wouldn't have been stung, right? But everything is always perfect. And because I didn't listen to her, I had the experience, right? So so um, I'm so sorry about the mount. Please forgive if it's jiggling. Let's move forward in time now to your fear death experience. Okay, so... When I was in high school in Pacific Palisades, California, there's a very famous curve there on Sunset Boulevard called Dead Man's Curve. And even Jan and Deed made a song about it. I had a best friend that lived on that corner and died in an accident on that corner. I knew several friends in high school who died racing on that corner because we all used to race. And I was in the back of my friend's car when we were racing around that corner and he lost control and we spun out. And it looked like we were gonna die in a bloody fire and right when I realized that, I, my, a life review occurred. My life flashed before my eyes. And that's literally what happens. And it was like time was suspended. I saw the 16 years that had passed in my life clearly. But what it did is it showed me instances that were important. And then we crashed, but I hurt my knee, but nobody was, we made it. I was like, wow, it was, it was such a profound experience. It was, it was so much more real than this. And, um, you know, I carried that with me and it reminded me that's when my near death experience with the beehive came back to me in that time. And just a couple of days later, and I realized, oh, this is what that is. And my dad was a Christian scientist, which was Mary Baker Eddy, the first metaphysical movement, and he had had a lot of success with it. He was a captain in the Navy and fought in the Pacific in World War II, and my grandfather on my mother's side was also a cap was also in the Navy. He was a PT boat mechanic on Iwo Jima, and they both fought in the Pacific. Uh, my dad was old enough to be my grandpa. I didn't meet him till I was 11. He died when I was 23, um, and... Uh, my grandpa and I were very close. Now, this is another NDE, but it was his. So I used to go to the VA hospital in Long Beach to visit him and push him around on his wheelchair in the 70s. I was about 10 years old, and I was born in 65, so this is about 75. 
you know, six years after my beehive experience and before the car accident. And uh, I used to take him to the hospital in Long Beach, this giant veterans hospital, which was like full of Vietnam vets at the time and World War II vets. And they all used to smoke in the hospital. And grandpa would say, follow that line. You know, there's lines painted on the floor and I'd push him all over in his wheelchair. And so he died uh, three times while he was in that hospital. And the second time he had a massive cardiac arrest and he was laying on the table and he died. And so when I, they shocked him back into life, he was dead for five minutes. It took him, you know, I don't know how many times with the defibrillator. And uh, I came next week to see him when he was able to talk again. And he asked my grandmother to leave the room. My grandmother was really in love with him, but he was an alcoholic. The war had destroyed him. He was, he was a couple years younger than I am right now. He was 55 when he died. And uh, he said, Eric, I got something I want to tell you. You need to listen to me. It's very important. I want you to tell your grandmother this when I'm gone. I go, gone? Where are you going? Oh, just listen. He said, the last time I had a heart attack, I was laying there on the table. I popped out of my body and I was floating in the corner of the room and I could see all the doctors and the nurses working on me, but there was this warm light behind me. And as I turned, this is exactly word for word what he said to me. And as I turned around towards the light, I saw my mother. He really loved his mother. I saw my mother waiting there for me ahead of some gates and I started to move towards her and then boom, the most intense pain I've ever felt in my life put me right back in my body. It took two jolts and there I was. And he says, I just want you to know that your grandmother is really afraid of death and you need to tell her this because there's nothing to be afraid of, okay? And my grandmother and I were very close. She lived to be 97 years old and I used to visit her in the home at the end and I kept reminding her of this and it made it easier for her to go through the transition, you know, what they call passing away or death. And so I was like, wow, you know, that kind of explains what happened to me when I was a kid. That's what I was thinking. So now I've had some very profound spiritual, mystical, what I call beingness experiences. And uh, some were cultivated through practice, spiritual practice. Some were uh, drug induced when I was young with hallucinogens. And some were caused by accidents, like the car accident and the drowning one I'm about to tell you about. And um, what it did is it really set me on the path. I became a Bible scholar at a very young age. And then uh, I got deep into Christian science and I hit a wall. I was very successful. I was a, a healer. People would pay me thousands of dollars to pray for them. But I felt like it was just mental that there was something more. So I went to the forest and I started to learn from nature and I started to study all the valid spiritual traditions in the world. Advaita Vedanta all the different forms of Buddhism, Hebrew mysticism, Christian mysticism, um, so many, and uh, Hawaiian mysticism. And uh, there's a golden thread. I discovered that there's a golden thread, just like between all of us, that runs through the valid spiritual teachings of the world. And the ultimate truth, and you're not supposed to share this, but this is important. I just got out of the hospital. I need to share these things. The ultimate truth is I already am that for which I am seeking. I already have that for which I am searching. I. So the whole thing here, and I call this earth school, it's actually pass or fail. It's like kindergarten. And I call like graduating is getting out of the sandbox. You can either go onto the playground and play with the other kids, or you can jump and soar and go to the next level. It's your choice. Uh, it's really about love or fear. And it's about, which is the course of miracles. And it's about, um, about not misidentifying with the lie, with the small I, the story called Eric. I'm male. I was born at this time in this place. These are my parents. This is my heritage, blah, 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 blah. That's a story. But I am not a story. I am the music. And so are you. Because you are me. I is we. And the music has no beginning or end. It's unconstrained and unconfined. It's infinite. And it comes from the silence. The silence is the womb of creation. The stillness is the womb of creation. And the reason we're given this 
dream realm, which is exactly what it is, and that's what NDEs show you, um, is because we're here to learn what we are and what we are not. And um, it's funny, Ronald Reagan said this in a speech one time, but it's an ancient, ancient spiritual truth. And that is that the truth is always simple, but never easy. When you were reviewing your life, were you reviewing positive actions that you did or negative actions or a combination? That's a very good question. It was a combination. And actually at that time, I was a wild, I was smart and strong and like faster than everyone else. And I took advantage of that. So there was a lot of bad, to be honest with you. And, you know, that's funny. I'm glad you brought that up because compassion is the golden thread that runs through all the teachings The I already am. Once you have the experience, you realize that everyone is yourself and do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Yeshua told us the two commandments. That's right. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy mind, and all thy soul, all thy might. What does that mean? Because it's yourself. Love yourself. And then love thy neighbor as thyself. Right. Because there's only one awareness, one consciousness, one presence, one power, one activity, one awareness. And that's I. But that's capital I, not I with a dot, which is the story. Okay. Because God is real. It's music, but it's a word for our highest self. And we're afraid of our divinity, and it's sad. So I was going to go into the, the most recent NDE, okay. and I've had another mystical experience since then, which was unexpected but cultivated, so kind of expected. Um, so I'm a surfer. I've been surfing since I was a kid. I've surfed all over the world. I thought about going pro when I was a kid, but I'm a soul surfer. I'm not into competition. It's about the beauty, and surfing is a Zen art form. If you do it in competition or being pulled by a boat into the wave, that's a sport. It's a different thing. But surfing itself is a Zen art form. It's a great metaphor for the spiritual life. It's spontaneous. You have to face your fears. Your skills come into play. The way you discern the situation, the bottom underneath, the surface, the crowd, the swell, the wind, everything's all one together, but each is its own aspect like the diamond of awareness with all its facets. And surfing is an amazing metaphor for the spiritual path. Do I wanna go back out? Should I go sit on shore for a while? So my favorite local beach was a beach called Ho'okipa on Maui. And I lived on Maui for 13 years. And before I go forward, e aloha mana pono. We are all on the hero's journey and there are a lot of heroes in Hawaii right now. They have gone through such a horrible tragedy. I have friends on Maui still, and I lived in Lahaina for three of my 13 years. We used to have an art studio there. That's all burned down. And um, e aloha manapono means divine love, abundant good, spiritual power, balance and transform. It's the most ancient Polynesian chant. And I just want to give a shout out to all the first responders, not only there, but the West Coast has been on fire for 10 years. And it's in the worst firestorm right now it's ever seen from Canada all the way down to Central California right now as we speak. And Hawaii is still burning on the mountain, by the way. Kula is still on fire underneath, it's underground. So anyway, thank you for all you first responders everywhere, your heroes. And I'm sorry for your tragedy. And if anyone can help them, don't give it to FEMA or Red Cross. Give it to the locals. They're doing a great job. Okay, so I was surfing at Ho'okipa. And I, I've been going through <laughs> divorce, insolvency, and uh, and my spiritual path. And I was doing what's called woofing, which is where you work on organic farms for a work trade for a place to stay and a little food. And I had an old car and I was still surfing. I had at least a dozen boards over there still. And I decided after work one day that I'd go surfing. And I brought a friend with me that I worked with. And I just brought my longboard, my high performance longboard, and I didn't bring any big wave boards. And there were two swells coming. And when we got to the beach, it was windy. There was a big west swell, it was kind of closing out. And there was a north swell that was starting to show like it was going to hit. And Ho'okipa has very deep water outside of it. It's the most famous windsurfing beach in the world. It's on the windy side of the island. And um, it gets really big waves. It's huge they come out of super deep water and then they just hit the reefs and start to break and so it goes from like 35 
50 feet deep to like 12 feet deep and they start to break. And I would normally surf what was called middles, which is the left in the center. There's three breaks there. And that day I decided, I, okay, normally as a surfer, you sit on the beach, you watch the waves, you see how things are going, you make your decision and you go out. I didn't do that. I was really in a bad place mentally, my divorce, having no money, working all the time, wasn't eating the best diet. And I just decided to take Leilani. That was my 9-3. My wife bought me that surfboard as a birthday present. And it was the most beautiful board I ever had, custom made, of course. And, you know, it was a 9-3 high-performance longboard. You don't take those out in waves over double overhead. And it was already double overhead and getting bigger and really messy and sloppy. It was what we call victory at sea. And I told my friend, stay here. I'm going to go out for a while. And he sat on the wall and I went out. And at Ho'okipa, there's a parking lot up above on the point where the locals sit and also in the pavilions right there. And if they see giant waves coming on the horizon, they honk their horns in their cars and they let the surfers know because there's no warning there. It just happens. And it's like Honolulu Bay. It just comes. And so uh, I'm paddling out and I realized this was a mistake. I should not have done this. I need to go in. But in order to go in, you have to first paddle out, get outside what's called beyond the breaking waves and wait for the bigger waves. And then when one of those comes, catch it and ride it in. And so that's what I was trying to do. And when you have a board that's that big and thick, and I only weighed 150 pounds at a time, you can't what they call duck dive. You can't push it under the wave to bring your board with you. You have to let it go, hope the leash doesn't break, and then pull it back to you and keep paddling. And uh, I was almost outside. I'd made it through a bunch of waves, paddling, 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 super windy. And when it's really windy, it makes rain. The waves rain on you. And um, all of a sudden, all the horns in the parking lot started honking. Beep, 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 beep. And I look out and there's at least like eight to 10 waves set. A set is a bunch of waves uh, coming. And it's the north swell. It's coming from a little bit more to the north. And the waves are like the size of a five-story building. They're huge. You know, it was quadruple overhead, at least. It had doubled in size automatically and was getting bigger. So I went, ah, and I tried to scratch, 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 paddle as fast as I can, go over one, bounce, boom, the rain comes down. Second one, I barely make it. Now here comes the third one, and it's so big, and I don't know what, sh what I should do. Should I let go of my board? I stop paddling, and I'm looking at it, and at the last second, I let go of my board. And right as I let go, the lip of the wave hit my calves at about the back of my tail of my board, but like this much surfboard behind it, right where my calves were. And it instantaneously broke my board in half and left me with a foot of surfboard attached to my leash. Now, normally when you're in big waves and you're stuck in the soup, that's the white water, uh, your board acts as a flotation device, especially a big board like that. And it will pull you to the surface if you don't know which way is up, because that happens a lot when it's, I like bigger waves and um, you get ragdolled, you get tossed around, you know, I kicked myself in the back of the head. I was like, how could I do that? And um, so when I let go of my board the third time, it broke my board and it pile drived me right to the bottom of the ocean. Now, that's a reef. There's a there's a bunch of reefs there, but it's it's got sandy spots in between. And luckily for me, uh, when it pushed me down, I hit the bottom, but I hit so hard it was sand. Thank God, and it knocked me out. And and here's the thing. Two things happened. I came to a moment of decision, and it reminds me of the fear death experience in the car accident. There was a moment in that experience where I knew I was going to die, and I just chose to let go, and that's when I had the flash. Same thing. I gave up. I was in a power that was much larger than myself. I had been ragdolled like you wouldn't believe. I had been slammed in the bottom, and I was probably you know 25 feet down at least. And huge giant waves were still breaking, many, many, many. And um, I decided I couldn't make it. And in that instant, there was a pop, just like that. And I popped out of my crown chakra. And all of a sudden, I was a complete peace. And I was in this dark realm. It was 
it's a kind of black, but it's not black like the color. It's black like emptiness, but it was full. It was like comforting, warm. And I had a sense of body, but my body stopped here. There was nothing below it. It was like just that sense of awareness. And I, I went, wow, what's that? What's going on? And then all of a sudden I look up and I'm in this realm of spheres, bubbles, iridescent, clear bubbles everywhere. Like if you were underwater and a jacuzzi was making bubbles, right? And it's hard to remember if they were all the same size, but I, I think they were all the same size. And I was fascinated. I was aware. I was conscious. I knew who I was. Still had a sense of self. And I was looking around at all these bubbles and I was moving. They were coming around me and I was moving in between them and they weren't touching me. And I thought, wow. So I went up to one of the bubbles. It was right to my right side. And I turned and I stuck my face into it like halfway. And all of a sudden, I was four years old. I was back in that house where the beehive fell on my head in Corona Del Mar. It was a few months after that had happened. And I was trying to make sense of a very unwanted, brutal experience, which I'm not going to go into. I was abused. And um, I saw this experience. I relived it, but I was actually myself at four years old. And here's how you know. Colors look like they look when I was four. They're so vibrant. They're so real when you're that young. My mind was more innocent and it wasn't preoccupied. Sounds, colors, my dog that I remembered the flowers through the window, the way the light shined in the room, everything was magical. When you're a little, it's magical. And it was I was four years old and I saw clearly what that bubble was. It was a grievance that I had made against my mother for what she had, for an unwanted experience that she had thrust upon me and I was innocent. And I, in that moment, decided to hate my mother. And um, that was the first brick in the wall, so to speak, to borrow Pink Floyd phrase. And uh, I had a very tumultuous relationship with my mother in my life um, later in years. But I saw clearly, and at the time I was doing A Course in Miracles, and it's about not having grievances, to choose the miracle, which is what already is. Because see, we're in a state of is-ness. That's what being is. It's, it's never born. It, it doesn't have a beginning or an end. It doesn't have any limitations or stains. As the Buddhists would say, it's abiding, intrinsic, naked, luminous awareness. And um, that state is our true state. It's called isness. And one of my favorite teachers, Joel S. Goldsmith, uh, the infinite way, the first one that brought me out of the sort of church mentality, um, he was the real thing. He, he healed so many people through prayer and every disease. He's, he's well documented. And he has a truth that he said in the back of his first book, The Infinite Way, in the chapter called The Wisdoms, there's a line that says, is alone overcomes the world. That's right. If you can realize that, that the whole thing. So what is, is. And it's funny because Clinton, when he was being, when he was being uh, impeached, and he was lying about everything. He said, well, that depends on what the definition the definition of is is. Well, that's true. That's a very deep truth. What is is. I am is. Okay, so when I came out of that experience, okay, so going back to my body. So what happened was I'm getting ragged all in the water. It was probably, you know, a couple of minutes. The waves had sort of calmed down a little bit. And all of a sudden, I was at the surface and I was back in my body. There was no pain, but I was extremely tired. Almost every single ounce of energy I had had been used trying to stay afloat. And I had nothing to paddle on. My board was gone. And I'm a good body surfer. I grew up by the wedge in Newport. So um, I knew how to body surf in. So I, I was at the top. I could get my breath. And there's just, just giant surf everywhere. And it's starting to come in again. So I just caught the first wave I could. I put my arms back. I put my chest out. And I body surfed in and I made it and I I drug myself up on the shore with my last gasp of energy and I laid there for like a half an hour just trying to be able to move and my friend didn't even notice he was like down the beach talking to someone and he saw me lying on the beach and he came running he saw my broken board and what happened I said oh let's just go 
I was too tired to tell him. And so we went back to the permaculture estate I was working on. And I went into my little uh, kiva and uh, lie down to take a rest. And I have been practicing for a long time. So I always meditate and give my sleep to sleep yoga to God and for communion in your sleep because some people are answered in their dreams. And uh, as I was drifting into that space between awake and asleep, which I've had several experiences in, um, and prior to this I had, all of a sudden there was a flash of light and I felt this presence and I look at the foot of my bed, little tiny twin bed, and there's Yeshua sitting at the foot of my bed. And he's looking at me and he's stroking my foot. And he's speaking to me, but he's not opening his mouth. They always speak to you telepathically from the other side. And, oh, and remember, the only veil is the belief in a veil. There is no veil. So he just was looking at me and letting me know, like, at first that he was there. And all of a sudden, I could hear this voice in, in my head, but his words would turn to light. And I could barely catch the words. And I was so tired. I was like having a hard time catching what he was saying because they were the words would like turn into little light birds and fly away. And he he said, You are my songbird. And it's gonna make me cry. And then I can't tell you what else he told me, but you know, they talk about the sacred flaming heart of Jesus. It's true, he has this Merkaba. And was just glowing and pulsing and the 13 virtues were there. But I didn't know this at the time. And it was just, I just felt the deepest sense of love that was like, and the, the only phrase that I got out of the whole thing, and it was a Mary Baker Eddy phrase. And he, you know, the spirit will come to you through whatever your consciousness is entertaining. And, and um, since I was with Yeshua, I was using Christian terminology. And, um, and he said, you are the loved of love. You are the love of love. And then there was this rainbow and he disappeared. And I sublimated it. I didn't, it took me maybe a month to remember that because I was stuck in like almost drowning. And at the time I was doing A Course in Miracles for the second time. I had done so much study in my life, but I really felt like I was hitting a brick wall and I needed to go deeper. And it was about sacrifice and laying things off. And um, so I was given a, a Course in Miracles a second chance, which is the same teaching as so many others. And I realized, wow, that bubble was a grievance. And I called it the bubular realm. So did I die? Hmm. Perhaps briefly, but I didn't go to the tunnel or to the light. I could sense there was more, there was a light, but I was in that bubble realm and then I was taken out of it just like that. So was I underwater? Did I think I was a goner? Yes. So did I die? Yeah, because it's a choice. You choose. People don't, unless you're in like a horrible car accident, but even in that, if you have a chance right before it happens, you'll choose to leave like I did in mine. And, um, Here's the funny thing. Years later, I discovered something. In real meditation and prayer, which is listening from the heart, you know, your heart has a neural network. It has about 50,000 neurons, whereas your brain has billions. And all thinking is your enemy. But when you can allow the mind to be empty like space and full at the same time, but equipoise, equanimity, then you see that, that there's a deeper sense of uh, awareness that we can tap into and the way we do that is through that decision just like when i thought i was a goner at the bottom of the sea when i thought i was going to crash in my friend's car when the bees tried to kill me or defend their home um there's a conscious decision that occurs maybe you could call it subconscious where we say, I can't overcome this, and we let go. If you can get to that point in your prayer and meditation, 
where you let go of your story enough and you can sit in the calmness enough and you can watch thoughts like waves on the ocean, passing, arising and subsiding. They're neither good nor bad, not something I want or don't want. I'm not avoiding it. I'm not seeking pleasure or avoiding pain. I'm getting to that place of equanimity and equipoise. And I'm choosing, I don't know. There has to be a better way. Please, Lord, I'm listening. Your servant hears you. I want to know myself. I want to know you. Help me. I'm suffering. And then we say, I don't know. And we let go. And you don't go into a sleepy time. You, it's very dynamic and cognizant when you're in that place of equipoise. You are still, but it is dancing. And it is so beautiful. And when you have the experience in meditation, it's the same as a near-death experience. And you're not in your body. You know that you're not a body, that you have a body, that it's a vehicle, an instrument to convey love. You know that your mind is an avenue of awareness. It's an instrument of awareness. But you know that you are the witness. You are the aware I. I am. And it's not I am that. It's I am this, which is that. Is. Here's the power. Is alone overcomes the world. Now, since that drowning experience, I've had several inner deeper realizations about it like that i was seeing a grievance and that I, I let that grievance go i popped that bubble and i realized that we have to pop all those bubbles they're all a part of the story they're all why you come back reincarnation is definitely true there's only one awareness and if you don't get the lesson you come back that's why it says in scripture you lay up your treasures in heaven where a thief can't steal them and a moth can't eat them and rust can't destroy them why because it's a realization in your awareness it's an actualization and remember, we're living free of free. So what the spirit gave me when I moved to Hawaii later, and I had this license plate. I'm the only one in the state of Hawaii who ever had one extra letter on their license plate. I had I dash is we. I is we, the living sacred trinity, living free of free because freedom is a concept. Do you get me yet? If I'm already free, what do I need to be free from? Being free and dumb, Americans. Okay, so. I is we. That's the living sacred trinity. I is the name of all awareness. Unstained, unconditional, immutable, impersonal, universal beingness. Is, is the timeless presence that we're practicing. Always has been, always will be. And we is everyone. And we're in a quantum universe. And your mind is a quantum holographic projector. And it's actually trickster. Okay, so the devil is something that man created. But all the ancient traditions of the world on every single continent have tales of trickster. And trickster is your ego. It's your mind. Your mind is your enemy. It's your enemy. And all thinking is your enemy. But what we do is we train thought to focus on the absolute nature of things till we can quiet it enough that we can hear. Because your mind is like a bell. It's always ringing. And your thoughts are audible. You can see them, but you always hear your thoughts. Your thoughts are audible. That's why we have telepathy. It's the true communication. And um, if you can get the bell to ring, not in a dissonant way, but in a harmonious way, oh, that's a bell. It reminds you of the pure realm. It reminds you of the constant vibration of is. And you can let go enough that the waves on the ocean calm down and you can transcend. Because that's what we're doing. We're transcending the belief system of separate self. And we really are in a quantum universe. I is we. And that's the Buddha saying, the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. I is the Buddha because the your true nature of your mind is the Buddha mind, the Christ mind. And they work together. They're best friends. And so is Krishna and so is Lakshmi and all of them. But the thing is, is it's about love. It's about compassion. That's the golden thread that runs through all the traditions. It's, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And 
we live in a okay the law is lawful this universe is based on divine principles and sacred geometry is the only okay so lao tzu had said if you can say it or if you can see it it isn't such it's not god that's right because those are concepts in your mind they're thoughts but you can allow the flow the Tao, because that's what we are we're flow to flow through that's why we meditate and you're not being in the flow or out of the flow you're being as the flow just like surfing when you're in that zen space surfing after you've done years and years of practice to get to where you can get there because surfing is one of the hardest things to learn in the world it's really, it really takes a lot of stick to <laughs> you get pounded and, and in my day when i came up they had rules and the elders really held you to the rules it's not that way anymore but but uh surfing is really you know a great metaphor for the whole thing and um oh what was i saying i just lost myself there was it about the isness oh, sacred geometry sacred yeah, geometry yeah. okay so if you look on every continent besides trickster which is uh you know native teaching uh they also have sacred geometry it's everywhere and um it's always the same because at one time there was one one civilization on this planet that's who built all the pyramids everywhere they call it lemuria that's a true thing and they lived in their christ consciousness in their buddha self all the time and uh some natural disasters happened and took them out so we've been living sort of like like i heard it explained like pop, you know coals flying out of a fire popcorn flying out of a fire people's spark of spirit got put in all these religions and all these different places and they sort of lost the cohesive unity of the whole thing and of our our pristine origins as anastasia says and um that's it. We do have a pristine origin, and it's unchanging. And it's the omni words, omniscience. Omni means the all and only every. It's a Greek term. Omniscience is the all and only every awareness or knowing. You shall know. Truth doesn't make you free. You're already free. When you know it, you're freedom. And that's the thing. If you're trying to get free and you're seeking, you're never going to get it. Because you're already freedom. I already am. You're already freedom. You're already liberty. There's no liberation. And liberation is when you say, oh. they ask the Buddha on his dying bed, what are you? Are you a are you an avatar? Are you a demon? Are you a god? You know, are you a guru? What are you? He took a moment and he took a breath and he said, I am awake. And that's what this is about. We're all sleepwalking. And it's about becoming lucid. And that's what meditation does for you. And that's what these NDEs do for you. And I think it's very important that I'm, I've been keeping this secret because people will think you're a nut. And the people that know me know it's for sure because they know me. And I have shared with a few friends over the years, but I just, okay, so I'm a two-time cancer survivor. I survived skin cancer, surfing all my life, and testicular cancer. And um, I'm a half a eunuch. <laughs> and, um, and having bad teeth all my life. And um, not only am I a two-time cancer survivor, I'm an abuse survivor and, uh, and I'm a wealth survivor and, um, and I'm an extreme, uh, challenge survivor. And, and I think that we lose track because we get so caught up in the story. And if you look at the world right now, it's raging. There's more death and destruction going on right now than ever before. Now, of course, we're really connected these days you know electronically so we're seeing it more but it doesn't change what the underlying facts are and we have to learn what the absolute nature of things is so we can allow it to inform our relative experience they're not really two experiences they're two facets of the diamond which is your pure unadulterated awareness and that i that is we and so because it's quantum Every thought you have or don't have, every meditation you make, every breath you make, if it's conscious, is influencing the whole, you know, the butterfly effect, right? And so that's true. And think about butterflies. You know, they discovered recently that butterflies have this thing called imaginal cells. So when they go into their cocoon, they're, they're a caterpillar, they eat, they eat, they eat, they find a place, they make a cocoon. If they don't get eaten, they turn into this black goo before they become a butterfly. And that black goo has been discovered, it's called imaginal cells. 
it's got some kind of genetic information in it that will transform the caterpillar into a butterfly, but only through struggle. So the caterpillar loses its entire form, but all the essence is still there, even though it's material. And then it becomes a butterfly, but they did an experiment. If you try to help a butterfly out of its cocoon, its wings will be deformed and weak because they have to have the struggle to develop the colors and the, the veins and the, the strength in their wings, right? And there's been times where I've said, God, why won't you just leave me alone? Why, remember I told you it ruins your life. I've let go of everything. I was so wealthy. I let go of all of it. I just, I stopped everything. I wasn't trying to teach anybody or anything. And just, I just want to walk with you. I just, you know, show me. And thing is, is you're asking for the suffering because you want God. And it, it, you learn through suffering or science. You know, the universe is principled. And that's what sacred geometry is. You get back to that is it's the only thing that you can see and that you can hear. Okay, so math and music are the same thing. It's uh, Music is hearing math and, and mathematics is seeing math. Just like in your mind, you hear and see your thoughts. Well, music is that. And um, divine geometry is music, but it's also math. And, um, and it's perfect. And it's the only thing in the phenomenal realm, which is what this is, um, you know, it's always changing. As soon as you're born, you're dying. Nothing stays the same here. The only constant is change. But I never change. So that, uh, so I do this spontaneously. So sometimes it flies out of my head. Um, what was I saying? You were talking about spontaneously changing. Yeah. So complaining about the suffering ain't going to get you anywhere because see, you're stuck in your story. Oh, poor me. Yeah, that's Eric. Eric isn't real. And I like to make acronyms. So I want to share one with you about America because my name, Eric, E-R-I-C, is in the center of that word, which of course is a made up word and it has nothing to do with America Vespucci. It's a name for an Illuminati banking cartel. Let's be clear. It's called the Federal Reserve. That's who owns you. Okay, so America. Now, here's what it's been from the beginning, but I don't think this is not my America. So I'm going to tell you what it's been, and I'm going to tell you what it could be. America, arrogant men engaged ruining indigenous culture, absolutely. <gasps> Whoa, hit the nail on the head there. Arrogant men engaged ruining indigenous culture, absolutely. Uh huh. But what the spirit has showed me is there's another America, and this is my America. And I would like to see it spread. Will it? Mm, it'll be a miracle, but a miracle is part of the word. So a miracle extending real integrated conscious awareness. Oh. Ooh, let's say that again. A miracle extending real integrated skin color blindness, conscious awareness. Oh, I, I like that. That's the America I strive to make. You know, my grandfather invented the savings and loan. Um, and I have quite a story. And also, if you want to do another video at another time, I've had a few uh, abduction experiences as well. And they're also real. And uh, there's more to it than people think. But it's also, there's so many similarities. You know, you found me because I made an NDE video on my, which is my most viewed video on my very obscure little channel called Songbird I as We on YouTube. I used to have tons of teaching videos on there and videos that were documenting my struggle. And I took them all down recently. I'm going to revamp the channel, the channel, but I left the NDE video up there. It has about 4,000 views and it was me. I was going through cancer at the time. I didn't know if I was going to be around. I just wanted to share that experience because I had seen another NDE video and it looked like it was really helping people. And I thought, wow, this is probably a good idea. And, um, and I also believe since then, I've seen other videos about the bubular realm. I'm not the only one that's experienced that realm. Mm. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of commonalities with what my grandfather told me, with my fear death experience, with all my commune. You know, I, I did a lot of drugs when I was a kid. And I got a great metaphor for you about drugs. I had a Native American friend in Oregon who was clean and sober, and he watched a lot of his relatives go down to alcoholism and drug addiction and i was buying a bunch of uh rhododendrons at a nursery where he worked and 
he really liked me. And he goes, why do you smoke that herb, man? I don't understand. He goes, don't you know what that is? And I said, what? He goes, well, let me give you a metaphor. So do you know, you know, a kiva is a meditation room, like the one I'm in right now. And the natives used to build kivas. And he says, so say you have a ladder on the outside of a two-story kiva, and there's one entrance up at the second floor, and the, the floor inside is a trampoline. You dive into the kiva, you hit the trampoline, you bounce up. You could see the way out, but then you go down again. You could see the way out, but and you never get out. He goes, that's drugs and alcohol. Wow. Wow. And so I brought up the hero's journey. I have an acronym for hero, but I don't have it here. Here's one for love. Let Omni value everything. What's value? Value isn't worth. In this country, people think their wealth is their worth, to borrow a Rasta to praise. Your wealth is not your worth. Your wealth is your curse, unless you're using it to help others and it just keeps growing because that'll happen if you're benevolent. But your value, what values your life? The truth. And there's so many lies that we're in a world full of lies these days, you know? And it's always been your opportunity to see it as a lie or allow what's underneath it. And that's, I'm going to tell you about an experience I had a couple of years ago, which you'll love. Before we go there, let me ask you a couple questions here. Absolutely. Would you say that the bubular realm is almost another opportunity of a life review because you could just pop into bubbles and revisit old memories? That's a very good point. I never thought about that. That's what it is. It's the real Instead of seeing it on a screen, I saw the bubbles because the bubbles are solidified choices you made, but they're bubbles. They can pop. They weren't glass. You know, they had membranes that moved. I put my head in one, right? And oh. we're in a spherical realm here, although who knows, you know, the actuality of the deepest sense of things. And I see the universe as sort of like your body. Like if we could see the entire shape of the whole universe, that would be your body. Um, but yeah, that bubbly realm is that because what it is, it's where you store it up. It's like the divine awareness. It's infinite. There's infinite space. And each of us has that. And you're filling it up with bubbles. And those bubbles are your decisions that affect your life and the ones around you, good or bad. Which, as Shakespeare said, there is neither good nor bad, but thinking makes it so. Ah, oh, there's that devil again. The trickster, the mind. Well, after you okay. experienced that bubble, did it pop? No. No, it remained, and I went back in in meditation and popped it. Hmm. And since then, I've been asking how to pop them all, and I think that's why I've been going through some really deep challenges lately, because you hold on to the bubbles. You don't realize you're keeping them alive, you know, subliminally. And, okay, so if you want to find God, there's two things that are really important. Self-honesty. Number one, we're all lying to ourselves. We're afraid that God's mad at us. This is the Course of Miracles. We're afraid that God's mad at us because we think we split off to be our own little devil and be ruler of hell instead of servant in heaven. But that's not true. And, and so, you know, we're, we have this guilt and fear. Fear is false evidence of being real. I didn't make up that one. That's the Christian science metaphor uh, or acronym. But I did make up one for doubt. And this one really helps. Deception overlooks universal benevolent truth. Oh. Yeah, deception does overlook universal benevolent truth because you're being deceived. You think you're a little body, a separate self. You're not. I guarantee it. You're not. I bet a billion dollars on that. Okay, so I know it's true. And, uh, you know, at this stage in my life right now, I haven't had a car for several years. I live where there's no buses. I live by grace. I live by what's in my pocket. And by what the universe wants to do. And um, just staying now. Now is all that's real. You know, thoughts are the past and the future. And they're not now. Earlier, you mentioned a Rasta term. And when you talk about I is we, it reminds me of the Rasta term I and I. I and I. Okay, so I'm glad you brought that up because I followed so many Rasta bands when I was young. I was into Roots Reggae and I used to just follow them all. And I used to think they would say, I and I, which was wrong. I used to tell all the Rosses, you're wrong. It's not two eyes. And they go, no, it's I in I. I is I. And the Rosses know, the deeper Rosses do know. So do the Hawaiians. The Hawaiians have a teaching called emptying the bowl. 
so uh, it's everywhere, just like sacred geometry, just like the truth. And gold is a great metaphor because gold never goes anywhere. It's purified. It's a symbol for truth. And it's purified by fire. And it never goes anywhere. You can scrape it off, but you can't get rid of gold. If you evaporate it, it turns into monoatomic gold. There, it doesn't go anywhere. And, uh, you know, that truth will meet you wherever you are. That's one of the divine principles of the universe. Remember, this universe is scientific. It's principled. And all those principles are absolute. I is we is a principle, unchanging. And really, those three words, you get the whole, you could be completely illuminated if you if you realize what those mean. And I'm a mystic bard, and you brought that up at the beginning. That means that because I've had mystical experiences, uh, okay, in ancient times, we lived in small villages, and we knew each other. Our marriages lasted because we grew up next to the person we were we were going to marry. We knew their their relatives. We lived in a simple, we grew our food. It was and usually on the outskirts of the village, there was what they used to call shaman, but it's really a bard. It's the person who remains attuned to spirit and then comes once a week or once a month or once every couple months to the village and sings songs, poems, to remind them of their purpose and their identity and the truth. And that's what a mystic bard is. They take their experience, which is beyond words and thoughts, and they bring it down through the heart and, and the hand and they make music or they write poetry or they write books or they make paintings or they create gardens. Your, your heart is a garden. And, you know, the Buddhists say samskaras and the, and the Hindus, those are seeds of affliction. Don't water them. Pull those weeds. Now, in actuality, there are no weeds. And when we get to the higher place, you'll see that even those samskaras, even those afflictions were there to teach you how to pop the bubbles. The seeds have all the information within them of whatever they are. It's already the tree, but it's not the tree, but it is the tree. And, you know, K Khalil Gibran has a great poem about the river being afraid to enter the sea. But here's the thing. Once you drop a tear into the ocean, try and find it. You can't. And Yet you're now, it's like a ray of light with the sun. They're not two things. I and my father are one. Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Let me ask you a question here. Sure. If you had a friend that was suffering over the loss of a loved one that had passed, what type of advice would you give? Thank you for asking that, because that's really why it's Lahaina that triggered me and all my friends that died in fire up north. Um, well, I first of all, I'm going to tell you something very important. I would not yell metaphysical platitudes at them. I would not. Oh, it's okay. It's not real. <laughs> yeah, they'd shoot me. Um, no, first I would hold them. I would see them. You know, in the Bible, when you used to lay with somebody, they would say you knew them and then he knew her, right? We had a deeper connection. We've lost the sacredness of sexuality. But so the French call an orgasm, the, the little death. Um, they're close to each other. I would say, first of all, I would comfort the person. I would listen. And I was a big brother, big sister when I lived on Maui. And they teach you that children are like sponges. And that if the sponges are already full of water and you're trying to give them something, it's just going to flow off. You have to recognize the opportunities for teaching, it's called. And you see when the sponge is getting dry. And then that's your moment. Like I was driving my, I was doing a one-on-one -on -one with a kid and I was driving him home from Lahaina to Kula, which is, these are the two places that burned. And uh, we stopped at a stop sign. A car went through the, the stoplight and there was an accident right in front of us. And he turned to me and he hadn't been listening to me. And he turned to me and all of a sudden the sponge was dry. And he said, Eric, what happened? So I said, oh, he ran the red light. He broke the law. That's what happens. You take a risk when you break the law. Oh, that's spiritual right there. And he got it. He said, oh, thank you. I'm sure, it made him a better driver eventually. So see, that was a teaching moment. Now, with my friend that lost somebody and all you people who I know have lost a lot of people recently. I'm sorry for that. 
You can't lose them. You can communicate with them if you want. We all have mediumship. It's within all of us. It's only one consciousness. They're still here. They didn't go anywhere. It's just the belief in the veil that seems to separate us. Uh, you know, just remember the word is. Is alone overcomes the world. I would, if they wanted, depending on what their need was, I could teach them how to communicate. I could communicate for them and tell them things only that person would know because that's how it works. It's valid. It's genuine. Um, or I could teach them, maybe they want to learn how to approach it spiritually. Maybe they just want a glass of water, a cold cup of water in Christ's name. Whatever it is, the most important thing is that you don't try to push your belief system on them. And if you do have the knowingness grounded in your heart of the experience, the opportunity will arise. You just stop. You say, not my words. Your words, universe, your words, angels, your your words, God, your words, Yeshua, you, your words, Buddha, you speak through me to help them. I don't know what to say. It's all in those I don't know words because knowing already is. It's all in those words. I already am. Who is I? Who's saying that? Now, remember what I said in the beginning. The truth is simple. It's very, very simple. You could probably say it in a thousand words. Say it in one word, I. But it's never easy. Why is it not easy? Because we're in this dream. So the first thing is self-honesty, which means you have to be honest to everybody else too because they are yourself. And you'll think you're being honest and the spirit will show you how you deceive yourself. It's amazing how much we lie to ourselves. And if you find yourself getting stuck in a toxic feedback loop in your mind, just recognize it and don't pay attention to it. See it, acknowledge it. Hi, Mara. I could have tea with you today. That's a Buddhist name for the devil. I could have tea with you today, but I have no time for you. I see you, but sorry, I got to go. So you're not denying it. You're just not giving it power. Because why? Because I is the power. You know, twice you've, the only power. Twice you've said that this side is the dream. Yes. So to me, that means that the other side is reality. Awake, like Buddha said. What I found fascinating is you said there is no veil. It, it's only there because we believe it's there. So can all you kind power of... power is given unto thee. Okay, so we have to give our all, all, small a, to the all, capital A. Giving all to all, the omni. When you do that genuinely through true sincerity and honesty, then it gives it back right away. That's the principle of the universe. Giving is receiving. We're not taking. You're not supposed to be a taker. If God is infinite and God is your awareness, you let that flow through, flow through you and you give. I of my own self can do nothing. He that is within me is greater than he that is within the world. It is my father who is the power, my mother whatever you want to call it, the spirit, awareness. And people keep saying, oh, there's only one doctrine. No, 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 no. You're going to burn in hell. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. There is one doctrine. It's infinite. It's been coming down through all time, and it's been spoken in different languages to different cultures throughout all time. But the ultimate of it is the same. I am and the golden thread of compassion. Okay. And, and the music, sacred geometry, the sacredness. So saying that, I want to tell you about a, what a flower taught me. So after my divorce and my second bout with cancer, COVID happened. My job got closed down. We were on lockdown. I was recovering alone from testicular surgery. And um, uh, I was doing Zen. Um, uh, uh, Zazen and Dzogchen, uh, Vajrayana, uh, Buddhism, the absolute Buddhism. And um, I had been walking everywhere, you know, 10 to 20 miles a day. And, um, and one day I'd had a really great meditation that morning and I was like watching the birds and I was living in Arcata in Humboldt County. I lived up there in the Redwoods for many years, and it's a very beautiful place. And 
I was like looking at the butterflies and just walking down the street. And it could have been a leaf on any tree. It could have been dirt on the ground. It wouldn't have mattered. But I looked up and I saw this, just happened to glance up while I was walking. And I was saying, Namo Amida Boots. Namo Amida Boots. And that's uh, the Japanese way of praising Amitama Buddha's pure land. And he's the Buddha for all the wickedness. He takes away your wickedness. And just chanting, Namo Amida Boots, Namo Amida Boots. And I looked up and this little pink, the oldest rose on earth. Remember the rose is the divine mother. Little pink uh, uh, prima ballerina, they're called. It's rose hips. They grow wild everywhere up there. And you make these little pink four leaf roses. And I looked up and the, the little rose in my mind silently through telepathy sang me the universe and showed me the underlying reality, which I've experienced in the past. I immediately in the street, on the sidewalk, dropped to my knees sobbing in joy and i literally was floating for like two days and then i made the mistake of telling my friend who's a buddhist about it and immediately i lost it because we're supposed to keep the pearl of great price sacred you paid everything for that pearl don't just throw it before the swinish element they'll trample it what is the swinish element that's the ego the personal sense of self the carnal mind as paul said and and we lose our grace we're supposed to live by grace. Grace is like, it's okay. It's all right. There is no wrong. There's just avenues of realization. And so, yeah, it's a dream. And what are we doing? We're awakening to the fact that we're already fully awake. There is no awakening. There is no liberating. There is no freeing because you already are freedom. You already are liberty. You already are awake. And when you realize that, you get to be God. And, um, you know, one with your source, God is infinite and infinite one is the only number. And this is a truth and you don't have to believe me. In fact, don't believe me. I was going to make a bumper sticker years ago that said, if you want to find God, don't believe. Why? Belief is putting your answer over there and you're never going to get it. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Why will you know it? Because it's already your essence. It's already what you are. You already have the Christ mind, the Buddha mind. You already have the body un indestructible. You already are infinite, the infinite way. You are the infinite way. And you don't lose anything. People are so afraid of losing their, you gain your sovereignty and dominion by deposing the king. You have to depose the king. You know who the king is? Your mind. That's the king of your world. And they're going to get you with smoke and mirrors. Like for instance, 72 or 73 gender identifications. I think not. That's getting you stuck in the story, man. You're neither male nor female. You could choose to be either, but actually in your true state, it's androgynous. It's neither. It's both. Eric, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are sure. you up for that? And if so, how should they reach you? Well, thank you for asking that. Okay, so I'm now available. I took myself out of the world for a lot of years. And uh, I didn't want to misguide anyone. You know, I have all my writings since I was 16. I have over 10,000 love songs to God. I did a radio show with that kind of poetry for years. And if you want to find me now, you can email me at dancingwolf101, the numbers like the highway, at gmail.com. And he can put a link in there. You can go to my YouTube channel and comment. That's songbird I is we at YouTube. Um, I'm not going to give my phone number out. If you contact me directly, I can, we can go from there. I can meditate with you. I can counsel you. I can hold you, you know, whatever you need. Remember, you don't have to physically be present with me because we're already one. And, uh, I just was in the hospital two weeks ago for diverticulitis. I don't know if you've heard about that. It's extremely painful. I don't know cute situation where I passed the stone out my rear and uh TMI sorry and uh it made me realize that I'm in the last chapter and I really want to spend it in full service as much as I can and so 
if I can help you, I know there's a lot of people losing everything right now and fire and war, and famine and, and, and you people, I hope you realize Americans what's coming for us. It's, it's getting bad and it's going to get worse. And that's okay. Those are appearances. It doesn't take the truth away. It doesn't change the truth. You can have joy right here in the midst of the storm, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Not even the smell of fire passed upon them, even though the guys that threw them in the furnace melted. Why? Because they were in there with the Holy Spirit. They were in there with their divine self. And they sacrificed everything for that. And then they were made rulers. Okay, now these are, you know, the Bible is very metaphoric. Um, but there's stories in the ancient traditions of the world um, that are all the same. They're just told in different words. Because when you have the experience, it's going to be new each time, but each, because you're going to be evolving spiritually, but you have a, a, a defining factor. You'll know it's true because, first of all, you won't doubt. It's beyond, it's the peace that passes understanding. That really is true. It's beyond words and thoughts. And when you have it, there's no doubt. It ruins you. It changes your life because now you realize, oh, I was wasting my time. It's okay. There's no such thing as time. And it's always now. It's always now. And and the and the you know, the thing there is to be honest with yourself. And you can find it in any tradition. You don't have to be religious. You know, religion believes that you're gonna go to hell. Spirituality's already been to hell. Okay, and that's what this is about. And it's not that there's a right or wrong way that, okay, so I was friends with the guy that got talked to by the horse and Mr. Ed. There used to be an old TV show about a talking horse. And the, the actor that played the man that the horse talked to, his name was Alan Young. That's Robert Young's brother. They were very famous actors. His brother was a movie actor. He was a very good friend of my father's and my dad. And after my dad passed, he was talking to me when I had my ranch up in Oregon. And I was in my 20s and I was intense and driven and just, uh, and he knew me from Christian science and he knew I was successful. And he said, Eric, Eric, calm down. I want to tell you something that's really going to help you. Remember this little ditty and it'll save you from a lot of suffering. I said, okay, shoot. He said, a serious individual is doomed to failure from the start, but a sincere individual is always a success because they begin in their heart. Yeah. You have a neural network in your heart. You have brain cells in your heart. Every single valid master took their heart throat, their heart throne seat, your true heart in the center of your being, and they remain there. Yeshua, Siddhartha Gautama, Krishna Gopal, all the modern mystics lived in their heart and allowed their mind, as the Buddhists would say, to be a perfect zero. What are you? Well, I'm a spiritual soul adventurer. I'm a spiritual trail guide, right? I'm a heart song giver. In fact, let's, if you want to finish this, how about if I read you one piece? Want to hear a quick piece that I just wrote? Yeah, please read it for us. This is just a quickie. It's kind of rhymy. I wrote it about a week ago. It's unedited, but it's all right. It's called Rise to Arisen. Ain't nothing that satisfies once you've seen through all, all the lies and instantly come to realize a dream is a dream is a dream. Nothing is as it seems. To awaken through skillful means or wrathful if necessary makes the ego wary and afraid. Because you have become dismayed and disgusted with the way things appear to be. You've attained the view above the me, transcended all human necessity by realizing your divine sovereignty and giving all to all permanently, arisen through grace and dignity to the heights beyond what the eye can see, to live as awareness eternally. I am lives forever, always free of free. Great job. Eric, before we finish it up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Yes. Judge not by appearances. And when you're praying, don't look for the results. Don't 
close your eyes and then open your eyes and look for your results. And remember, prayer is listening. I'm here, Lord. I'm trusting you. Trust. You have a trust fund. You have an infinite well that the angels fill, and you do have a guardian angel. And, and if you guys want to talk to me about angel experiences or abductions or anything like that, maybe I'll make some videos about it. They're all real. The angels are real. You can call on Archangel Michael. But you need to learn sacred geometry. Um, a lot of you people might get help from Susan Geisman. She's an amazing medium, and she's got amazing free uh, uh, tools for you. Um, uh, Joel S. Goldsmith, The Infinite Way, uh, the Bhagavad Gita, uh, the Buddhist teachings, uh, the truth within the Bible, the Bible is a book of life, uh, the Kabbalah, uh, but especially Zen or like Dzogchen to me, or uh, the Tao. It really all comes from the Tao, the is, the flow. You are the flow. Remember that I is we and that love is you. Love is you. Because one is one and never two. Eric, thank you for that message. And thank you for being my guest. Well, thank you, Jeff. And I really, really appreciate you. And your channel is amazing. And you have some wonderful guests on there. And I know you have some UFO videos. So if you want to do one of those with me, we can do that. And just thank you for your time. And everyone, namaste. Recognize the sincerity in this man and, and the clarity in his plan. And remember the infinite I am. Thank you, Eric. Have a great rest of your day. See you later. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.